All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Father, could you open us up in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this time. We thank you for the wonders of this world, this universe, this technology, which can help us come together. We come together in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, whose priest I am. We invoke the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our minds and our hearts and even our bodies through this interchange as we discuss your kingdom and as we try to, to really dig into the depths of the wisdom of your love so that we can experience true freedom and true holiness in Christ. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of, God. of God, pray Amen. for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Lawrence, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks again, um, Father. We're so excited to have you here. You're definitely a fan favorite of um, us at Avila Foundation, spiritualdirection.com. I actually personally, it was your one of your articles on Root Sin was my first contact with this mission. Um, and it was life changing for me, obviously, because here we are. So, so much gratitude towards you. And um, I know that a lot of our people were um, always, always, always promoting the better part for the best resource on daily mental prayer. Um, so I want to just show that on the screen here real quick uh, before we get started. Uh, we It's available at Sophia. You can find it on Amazon as well. And um, why don't we, as we get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what the better part is and kind of the inspiration mm -mm. for writing this. And then we can get into some of the questions that people sent over um, and, and go from there. Okay. Sounds good. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of uh, this evening. And I think I see some familiar faces there in the gallery. So that's nice. Uh, so the better part really came out of of my vow of obedience. I'm a member of religious order, the Legionaries of Christ. I make a vow of obedience. And I received an email from our headquarters in Rome back in 2000, and I think it was 2006, saying that uh, we need a new resource to help people pray because uh, one of the ministries that we do in, in my order is a lot of spiritual direction with lay people, a lot of retreats to lay people. We really believe in the power of the lay charism and the holiness of the lay people is the future of the church, this new, new Christendom, which is emerging from our post-Christian culture. So, and, and it was interesting in this assignment that I received from my superiors saying, so our, our men throughout the world who are delivering these retreats and giving the spiritual direction, they are really sensing that the Holy Spirit is moving these lay people to a, to a deep, a real life of mental prayer, not just prayer by rote, not just saying prayers, but really going deep in that personal prayer of mental prayer. And, and so the, the assignment was, so we need a new resource because the old resources aren't really helping people that much. Uh, and we need something that's going to be useful for men and for women, for old, for young, for people who are starting and people who are experienced. And it has to be completely centered on the gospels and we need it by December. <laughs> so, so that was kind of my assignment. Uh, and, and so I, I put together a little kind of ad hoc commission with some other people, uh, some religious, some lay people, some consecrated women, and brainstormed a little bit, came up with the structure, uh, with I, probably most of you are familiar with. And the idea behind the structure was really simple. Um, we want to know Christ completely. We want to know Christ from every angle. We want our, our own person to interact with Christ completely for that transformation into Christ, which is the core of the Christian journey. So you have different sections. You have the Gospels included, so you don't have to have your Bible in one hand and your meditation book in another. It's all there together. Mm -hmm. And then the different the Gospels divided up into those different passages. And each passage has a commentary that devoted to Christ. The Lord brings out the aspect of Christ's own kingship. He's the one we follow. He's the one we obey. And Christ, the teacher, he's always teaching with his example, with his words, even with his silences. He's always enlightening our minds. So not just our wills, we serve Christ the King, but our minds, our intellects, we learn from him the meaning of life, who God is, 
what the purpose of things are. Uh, and then Christ the friend, because it's not just our minds and our wills, but also our heart. He wants a relationship. He wants to walk with us. He calls us his friends. And then the fourth commentary is Christ in my life, which is written in first person singular. So it can help jumpstart your own time of mental prayer uh, if, if you've been having some trouble doing that. And then because you can always use it in group, uh, in a group as well for group reflection and group discussion, you have some questions at the end and some references to the catechism if you want to touch on some of the doctrinal points that come out. So it's like this great, uh, it's a great resource for, for personal prayer, for group study. Uh, and, and you can kind of, it's, we, we want it to be an evergreen thing because the gospel's in it, you know, so uh, you can always go back to it and it's meant to spark your own conversations with Christ. And that's the, the whole introduction explains that method of, of mental prayer. So that was it. That's wonderful. And we have, you know, for anyone listening, if you're looking for a group, um, head over to apostoliva.org. It's A-P-O-S-T-O-L-I-V-I-A-E. And we have a ton of small groups on there. I think our goal is to have over 100 by the end of the year. I don't know where we're at on that goal, but a lot of small groups on there and our small groups use the better part for their discussion. So every time they meet gospel encounter groups. Um, so we're very familiar with that text and yeah, it's, it's just fantastic. Um, so uh, as you guys are here, Oh, Christine Rich, she says, hi, father, John, you're the reason hi, you're the person that connected her with Dan Burke too. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Dan and I go way back. Dan yeah. and I go way back. Um, so as we go along, I have a list of questions here. You guys were great in sending those in ahead of time. If something comes up for anyone listening, um, just throw it, go ahead and throw it in the chat box and we'll try to get to it. Um, so speaking of the better part and, you know, some of our, some of our people have been doing this, this, the better part for five years. Um, they just go over and over again with it. And this was actually one of the questions that came in. It says, how do you handle when your conscience is telling you, well, I've, I've read this meditation before and I get it. I already know this already. And with the scriptures and meditations, it's the word of God is living and effective. Um, he makes everything new. So, but sometimes they're struggling in their mind with this when they go to prayer. What would you recommend for that person? Wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, I'd love to have a conversation with that person about that question, but basically it sounds to me uh, like it, that you've been engaging in mental prayer for a while. And so when we do that for an extended period of time uh, over you know, years, then what, what begins to happen in our prayer can change. Uh, the, the mental prayer of someone who's just beginning this journey with Christ, who's kind of maybe had a powerful retreat, maybe just felt I need to go deeper in my prayer life. That type, what happens in that time with God is going to look different than what happens in someone who's been engaged in mental prayer faithfully for in you know, living a life of grace for many years. So it sounds to me like this question is, well, I'm very familiar with these meditations. I'm very familiar with these passages. Um, so I, you know, I kind of already know this. Well, I would really encourage you to explore, at least in your time of personal prayer, um, to, to, to go ahead and you know, respond to that, what's going on in your spiritual life, by giving yourself permission to be more simple in your prayer, to, to maybe for you, it's good enough one line from, from the gospel passage uh, that you read on Monday and kind of going back to that and simply pondering it and savoring it and letting it penetrate your mind and your heart. And that might last you for a whole week. Like you don't, nece you don't necessarily need new input uh, you know, for that time of mental prayer. We can always have new input in our time of study and learning the faith and going deeper understanding of the word of God. But the time of prayer is really meant to be an intimate encounter with God. In, our, in the early stages of prayer, that involves a lot of our, our work. We think, we ask questions, who, what, when, where, why. Uh, you know, those journalist questions, they came from the medieval monks, a, a method of meditating on the scriptures, on the gospels. Uh, so we do a lot of work, but as we grow, God says, okay, you've been doing a lot of work. I've been sending my grace through that. Now I want to work more directly. So he kind of invites us to slow down. We become, we even encounter some dryness, you know, new ideas aren't moving us. We're not getting new ideas. That could be a sign that God is inviting you to a greater simplicity in your prayer. So go with that. 
So, okay, I'm just going to go to maybe my favorite passages. I don't need something new every day. I'm going to talk to him about that. I'm going to open up what's on my heart, listen to what's on his heart, and see what happens. And then do that for a week or a couple of weeks, kind of keep track of, of what happens in that time of prayer. Talk with your spiritual director or with a, uh, even a friend, if you don't have a spiritual director, about what happens and see. I think that's what that, that, that could be what God is up to. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, Father, is when, you know, instead of getting something new every day, just this more some simple prayer is something new for them. And it could be frightening for them. Oh, yeah. It's it, it's very disorienting. It can be very disorienting. There's no Latin phrase uh, that can help in the midst of that disorientation. It's uh, it's non multa sed multum. Non multa sed multum, which means not many things, but much. Mm-hmm. And as our spiritual life advances, we don't feel a need to kind of go after as many things. We don't feel a need to kind of be spiritual gluttons and learn everything and read. No, in our spiritual life, we, we find ourselves being drawn to, to certain points of revelation that, uh, that really connect with our heart. And that can be very disorienting because I used to be so busy in my prayer and working so hard. Now I feel like I can't do anything. What's wrong? What's wrong with my prayer? And maybe nothing's wrong with your prayer. Maybe that's where God is leading you. Uh, but it's really good to have someone you can talk about that with, because sometimes, you know, sometimes there are uh, hidden attachments which can impede us, which can we get to a kind of a roadblock in our prayer because there's something um, that we're not fully aware of that God wants to bring to the surface. And that so there can be some some other causes for that type of dryness as well. Yeah, even attachment to um, just like you said, all that work is like the achieving Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, another question uh, regarding praying with scripture. Do you have a recommendation uh, for a resource to better understand and pray with the Psalms? Ah, the Psalms. Yeah, the Psalms are really the prayer book. I don't know if some of you may be familiar I can't remember which father of the church, but a couple of the father church, fathers of the church used to call the, the Psalms the fifth gospel. Because in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we, we, get to, we get to learn what Jesus said and what he did. But since Jesus prayed uh, you know, as man, um, he also would use the, the Jewish prayer book uh, you know, of ancient Israel, which was the book of Psalms. So what happened in his heart is expressed in the Psalms, even on the on the cross, on his crucifixion. You know, why, why have you abandoned me? When he said, that's triggering a Psalm. There's a whole Psalm. It's the beginning of a Psalm. So he prayed the Psalms. So when we read the Psalms and we understand them, we actually, uh, we get to continue to discover Christ's own heart. So I would say a great resource for that is a um, fantastic resource. One of the last series of catecheses that St. John Paul II gave uh, towards the end of his pontificate, the end of his life, was he went through all of the psalms and all of the canticles, which go into the Liturgy of the Hours, because that's the main part of the Liturgy of the Hours is the psalms, and he commented on each one of them. So he gave a catechesis, he, like a, his Wednesday audience, that's where he gives his catechesis, his reflection, his talk, he gave talks on each one of the psalms. Mm. Uh, I'm sure they've been published in volumes, but you can also just get them from the Vatican website. Uh, you, you know, you can, and you can, you can use those. And so you can read the Psalm, then you can read his commentary and you can go back and read the Psalm. Uh, and again, when you're, when you're praying the Psalms, um, I mean, any good but biblical commentary as well, will have some explanations. Uh, but when you're praying the Psalms, what you really want to look for are those lines that kind of, that really pierce your own heart that resonate with you. And then you stay with them. This, this is the prayer book that was written by the Holy Spirit inspired scripture and their prayers. So everything that we experience in our own hearts is expressed somewhere in the Psalms. So we find if we, as we become more and more familiar with the Psalms, we find the words in the Psalms, which can express to God with greater eloquence than we can come up with ourselves, what's going on in our hearts. Very, very rich source for our prayer. Amen. I definitely agree with that. It's like, you find this Psalm and it's like, that's exactly what I feel. You know, it, like you said, it just expresses it so deeply in a way that 
speaks, you know, heart directly to your heart, you know, just what you need to hear. So thank you for that. If anyone listening wants to um, throw the link into that on the Vatican website, that'd be great. I, I don't know if uh, anyone could do that for us. Look at that. Someone's holding up a uh, Psalms and Canticles. There it is. So there it is go. published in different volumes. You can find them there. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. A great resource. Great. Thank you. We'll, we'll post the resource after when we post this webinar, we'll, we'll find it for you guys. Um, so yeah, root sins, we've got these great articles on root sins and we've got it in the, the little survey and navigating the interior life. And so we love taking a look at that and it's helpful to us. So someone says that asks the question, do we all have a root in each of the deadly sins, but deeper roots in just one that is dominant and, and, or how do you separate the root sins, the three root sins we talk about, um, with pride, vanity, and, uh, sensuality, comfort versus the seven deadly sins. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. There's, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of ways that could be answered and there's a lot of different um, even different answers. I wouldn't say there's necessarily one absolute answer to that question. Um, the uh, the seven, you know, the seven deadly sins, the capital sins, uh, are are really linked to the different powers of the soul. Uh, you know, kind of where, and so they they kind of they become vices which contradict the the proper use of the powers of our soul, and the proper use of a power soul or the proper development is a virtue. Right. So if you kind of if you do a little diagram, I think I um, I made there's a chapter in one of my books, a book called 60 Days to Becoming a Missionary Disciple. There's a chapter there on the emotions and the feelings. And you kind of you can see kind of a map of the basic human emotions, uh, which are which are kind of at the root of our vices and our and our virtues. So the seven the seven capital sins is a way of understand kind of uh, the different aspects of our powers of our soul. Uh, which can go awry. Now, the three root sins is a little bit more, um, and the, the well, going back, the capital sins, the, the theological insight on the capital sins is those are the ones that spawn other sins. So if you keep falling into certain sins, you know, you want to trace them back to some of the capital sins. And then the root sin concept is simplifies that even more. And the way that I would actually describe, I think the way that's most useful to understand the different root sins is you know, where we're supposed to find and seek our meaning is in our relationship with God, because we're created to live in communion with God, to know him, to love him, to obey him, to praise him, to receive his love, to receive his grace. Friendship with Christ is the core of Christian charity. So because of the fallen world and our fallen nature and our darkened intellect and our deviated will, we tend to seek that fulfillment in things that are not God. And the three root sins, um, it kind of link to the, to the first letter of St. John, where he talks, about, um, he talks about three different kind of areas of sin. But the three root sins in kind of the Christian tradition, which is in navigating the interior life, you can seek your meaning in God, that's the right place, uh, you can have a tendency to seek that meaning in your own achievements, in your own excellence, and that's pride. You can tend to seek that meaning and that fulfillment in what other people think of you and other people's approval and affection. That's vanity. And you can tend to seek that the fulfillment, your contentment in material pleasures and material comfort. That's sensuality. So we all have a tendency to seek uh, meaning and happiness in all those different things, because in the end, all those different things are actually, they're actually good things. We're actually created and called to make an impact on the world, on creation, on the universe. Now we created, put Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, go cultivate the garden, go subdue the earth. So we're actually called to achieve things, to make things, to do things. So when that's ordered, that that's becomes a way, a, a way for me to deepen my communion with God. Uh, and we're, we're called to live in relation with others. We need to be loved. We need to be seen and understood. Right? So, so at the root of, of that disordered kind of search for people's approval is a healthy need. And then same with uh, the physical, we have bodies. You know, We're created 
with the capacity to experience pleasure. Food tastes good because life is good. There's a message from God in those healthy pleasures, right? So, um, so we all have, uh, we're all drawn to those things because of, who, because of who we are as we're created. But because in our formative years, um, that's when, you know, because we, we grow up in, a, in, in this broken world, this fallen world, we have a, a damaged human nature. So usually in our formative years, uh, some of our, our basic needs are not met in a healthy way. And that creates a certain penchant or um, kind of a certain tendency, depending on the circumstances in which we grow up and then our own, you know, our own DNA and all kinds of other factors that we're not, you know, we don't know completely. Uh, but we, we tend to have uh, one of those that we, that we kind of grasp, we tend to grasp it more energetically than the others. Uh, depending on what happens in our formative years and which needs that we have are met and, uh, and, and which needs aren't met. So we all have all three of those tendencies. Their original direction is good, but their disordered direction causes a lot of problems because we make idols out of those things. And so that, that leads us away from communion with God. Um, but each one of us tends to have one of them, which is more, uh, there's like a stronger magnetic force for some people to, to seek to super achieve. And that's, what's going to give their life meaning or to seek people's approval to be, you know, to be loved by others. That's, and they, you know, a disordered uh, pursuit of that, that would be vanity. So that's kind of a, just the beginning of an answer to the whole theology of, of sin and original sin and personal sin and woundedness. Uh, but I think that, I think that can help maybe, I hope. Yeah, it's even interesting how sometimes in our root sins is it's it's we're trying to find meaning in it too, but it's even how we can present ourselves to God. You know, like, well, you know, if I if I achieve all these things or if I do, you know, if, if he approves of me, if I please him type of thing, um, sometimes we can uh, present ourselves in that way too and it can get confusing. Um with with the root sins, um can they, so we have one that's more dominant and a lot of people have gone through this healing process and it's like, oh, I really thought my root center was vanity, but I'm just healed of that. I don't, I don't care anymore what other people think of me. And I, I'm really confident in what I think about myself. And now I think my root sin is pride. Um, and, you know, they get humbled and now they just don't really care about achieving or what, you know, excellence in their opinions or anything like that. And, now they're just really don't want to do anything except maybe just eat and <laughs> sit at home. And now maybe they think their roots in is, is uh, sensuality, you know, does it change at all? Yeah. <clears throat> so no, the roots in won't really change. Um, but I think what you're describing is uh, it's, a, is, is something we can fall into in the spiritual journey, which is uh, get getting, mm, well, let's put it this way. So, you know, some of the great images of the spiritual life from the doctors of the church, like St. Teresa, talks about the soul as a garden. And in the purgative way, the kind of the first, the first stages of, of real spiritual growth, we're weeding out the, the bad plants in the garden. And we're taking out the rocks that are there that are impeding the soil from being able to, so we're kind of cleaning it out. Um, and that's when you're, you're identifying your vices and you're trying to correct them by actually exercising virtue. Um, and then uh, as once we, the virtues then would be the good plants, right? That God plants the seeds of the virtues and we nourish them. And then they begin to bear fruit, the fruit of the spirit in our soul. Uh, so what can happen is uh, we, can, we can get stuck um, in becoming obsessed with the weeds. When actually, once we get, you know, the, the, the garden cleared certain and to a certain degree, then we want to focus on nourishing the good plants and weeds are going to come up here and there. And you're going to find sensuality weeds and you're going to find some pride weeds and you're going to find, and you may, you may um, later on discover that you thought you got something out by the root, some bad plant out by the root, but the roots are still there. And so they send up shoots in different areas Oh, wait, so we've got to go deeper in there. And that would, that's kind of the, the transition from the purgative to the illuminative way when God begins to reveal maybe some, what I like to call the roots of our root sins. And usually it's some kind of a fear. 
some kind of a fear that again is, is linked to my own experience, which might not even be conscious, but it's at work impeding me from trusting God more fully. So he'll reveal that. And so when he starts to begin to reveal those things, you don't want to worry about, is that a sensuality or is that pride or is that, you know, what? don't worry about that. Worry about uh, how, what is impeding you from trusting God more deeply. And he's going to be showing you that. And he usually shows it to you by stretching your trust, by inviting you to trust more deeply. And that hurts and you're, and you're disoriented, you're scared. And that is where he begins to show you what's holding back deeper trust. Because the currency of intimacy in any relationship is trust. Mm -hmm. So if holiness means growing in my intimacy with God, growing in my communion with God, then I'm going to have to keep trusting more deeply, more fully. So if there's no limit to the intimacy that I can, that I can have with God, because there isn't, right? Where I'm a spiritual being, God is infinite. So this relationship is always going to keep growing, keep being new. So there's always going to be room for greater trust. So the things that come up in my life um, are always, you know, once you get kind of past the, those first stages of the spiritual life, are really the things that are impeding my trust. So don't worry about labeling them as pride, vanity, or sensuality, I would say. I would say focus on, no, where is God inviting me to trust more? And why is that hard for me? And kind of dig into that and see where he wants to heal whatever fear is there or counteract whatever fear so you can trust more deeply. I love that. That is great. And the other word that comes up for me too, when you're thinking about like trust is a lack of control, <laughs> you know, yeah. that can be a very fearful thing for, for all of us as we step out. So thank you for that uh, answer. Um, so since we talked purgative, illuminative, we did have a question uh, from some dear friends of ours. They said, regarding the unitive way, do you know any shortcuts? <laughs> <laughs> shortcuts to the unitive way. Oh, I like that question. Um, well, uh, I'm not going to give one that I invented, but there are spiritual writers who have emphasized, uh, well, I'll say two things. Um, maybe not a shortcut to the unitive way, but, you know, kind of the, this, the path, the most direct path to continued growth, right? And uh, there are some spiritual writers from the second half of the 19th century, first half of the 20th century, who talk about gratitude as the shortcut to holiness. That to cultivate uh, a mindscape, I like that word mindscape, I don't know if it is a word, but, you know, uh, basically a mental view of the world, which is dominated by, um, by gratitude. Uh, opens us up to constantly be receiving God's goodness. Uh, in a sense, gratitude is the antidote to that fear, like a, a, a deep attitude, a mindscape of gratitude, uh, which we can form. Gratitude is a virtue that we can exercise, especially if there's a tendency to anxiety or a tendency um, to depression or a tendency to uh, yeah, all, all those different forms of, uh, of kind of that negative energy, right? Gratitude is kind of the direct answer. It puts God in his place and, and constantly reminds us that his goodness is always flowing, right? And so that's what accelerates our capacity to trust. So that's one thing. And then there's another, there's one of the, the most often quoted pieces of spiritual advice is from Thomas Akempis's book, The Imitation of Christ, in which he says, if we would just overcome uh, one vice a year, we would soon be saints. Now, you can turn that around and say, if we would just develop and mature one virtue a year, we would soon become saints. Very interesting how some of the most recent uh, behavioral psychology, the good behavioral psychology research that's been coming out, is, is kind of showing something similar. Now, they won't make the connection, um, but I love these connections between kind of not modern sciences and, and you know, the, the wisdom of the tradition of our spiritual lives. But talking about how if you really want to change a behavior, you, the, the, one of the co most common tendencies is to make a list of all the different things you want to change 
and then try to change them all at the same time. And when you do that, you end up making very little progress. Whereas if you kind of reflect and you think about what is the, you know, if I were just to change one thing, if I were to develop one virtue this year, mature in one virtue this year or this month or this week, whatever it be, that would make the biggest impact on helping me trust God more deeply, what would it be? And if you just choose one and then you say, okay, and, and how, what can I do? God's going to have to give me his grace to grow to supernaturally in that. But what can I do today, this week, with the one thing that I could do differently that would open myself up to grow in that area? So focusing, focusing on one thing, um, even, you know, my favorite passage from Luke chapter 10, where Jesus told Martha that she worries and frets about many things when only one thing is necessary. Right, this sense of what is the one thing necessary for you in this season of your spiritual life? You don't have to cover it all. You don't have to figure all of it out. But if you can just identify what, Lord, what are you asking of me right now? And just focus on that. Then that's the, that's the shortcut because he knows what's best. When we try to kind of going back to what you said, Anne, about control, if we try to understand everything and control it all, then we end up getting dispersed and we end up getting distracted. Uh, and that's one way that the enemy likes to work on our souls, uh, you know, to kind of, if he can't get us to do super evil things, he wants us to get distracted with a lot of good things that maybe God isn't asking us to do. So there's a, there's a thought there. Yeah. And if, if you guys can't figure out what virtue to start with, I think we're all just going to hop on gratitude because that's the, the other shortcut here, <laughs> but you know, what's so great about that too. If you think about the purgative way, usually the purgative way it's, it's purg it's purgatory it's purging it's purification it's tough and there's a lot, usually a lot of external chaos and in, interior chaos going on um, as the lord brings us through that and and when these hard things are going on and lots of detachments and and just healing happening um which can you know it's it's in the middle of the healing it can be painful but gratitude, like just being thankful that you're going through this stuff, thankful for the hard times. Thank you for the craziness. It it really does help, you know, it keeps you going through all of that and pursuing and, and continuing on in, in, in the healing and on that way. Um, yeah. Uh, a question in the chat box, going back to fear, someone's asking how um, how can we cooperate with God when he wants to heal us from fear? And I had another question someone sent in, which I think is a really good question. Um, how do we discern between fear and prudence? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's two different things going on there. I think uh, I'm going to turn on an extra light. The sun's going down here in Georgia. So I'm going to turn my light on. Sure. Right here. That might help a little bit. Uh, so yeah, fear is, is one of those concepts that's actually very rich. It's very, um, there's a lot of dimensions to it. Uh, so one part of the question was about the difference between fear and prudence. And the other part of the question was. How, how do we cooperate with God? If he, he wants overcome to overcome the fears. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> well, I think there's the first part that how do we cooperate there? You know, there's the direct and the indirect. The indirect is. Everything we do to nourish our life of personal prayer, our mental prayer, is strengthening our courage, strengthening our hope, strengthening our confidence in God. Because when we and it, we're spending time with Him alone in mental prayer, in whatever stage of prayer you're you're in right now, whatever season of life you're in, that is what strengthens our knowledge of God, kind of that biblical knowledge of God. And the more we know Him, the more we trust Him. So St. John talks about perfect love casting out fear. So as we grow, as we receive more and more of God's love, then we, we just become more courageous. Uh, so that's the indirect. And then directly, you know, when I know that God is asking something of me, or when I know that he, and, and I'm afraid of it, and uh, then that's a time to consciously exercise courage and hope. Those two virtues go together. Hope is the assurance, you know, I know that, that God is going to give me what I need to make, to, to make a successful journey to, to his house. Uh, and then courage is that ability, that energy that comes in the face of difficulties, in the face of things that, that are threatening, right? So uh, when we know that God is asking something of us, sometimes we just have to make an act of courage. 
uh, in that moment. And the more we've been cultivating a knowledge of God, a relationship with God, uh, in, in the normal times when we're not facing huge threats, the, the more resources we'll have to be courageous in those times of, of threat. And then the difference between fear and prudence. So fear is the emotion of fear is something that is good, right? We're created. Uh, it's one of the basic emotions that was built into our organism. When something is a threat to us, when something could cause damage to us, we feel fear. Like fear is a clue. Wait a minute, something is really dangerous here. And that can be very useful because that gives us energy to run away, to fight. When we know, if we didn't know when things were dangerous, that would be kind of a problem, you know, that would be an issue, right? So the emotion of fear is something good. So when I'm feeling something, when I'm feeling fear, the real important thing, especially in the spiritual life, is to, to be able to recognize that and to identify what's causing it. Because here's where our fallen nature gets us tangled up. Fear in itself is a gift. But because of our woundedness, we can often perceive threats where there really is no threat. And, and when we do that, we get fearful, and that triggers all kinds of uh, all this anxious energy. But we don't really need that anxious energy because there's not really a threat. It just seems like a threat. Uh, because of our woundedness, because of our vulnerability, right? So, so that's why when we experience fear, we need to say, okay, where is it coming from? And once we, once we do that, like taking the time to do that, learning to do that, getting help to do that, that's an exercise of prudence. Prudence is all about choosing the best means to achieve a good goal. And fear is telling me there's a threat I need to avoid. Okay, prudence steps in and says, okay, what's the threat? Is it really a threat? If so, what's the best way to avoid it? So they kind of go together. Yeah, I love that too. And a lot of times we just did um, a webinar last month on um, body, soul, and spirit. Even our bodies, which is a temple of the Holy Spirit, they the body keeps the score. It remembers trauma. So your body might just be telling you, you might experience anxiety. You might experience panic and this fear. You can literally feel it in your body. It's telling you danger, 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 but there's actually not danger there. Um, right. It's just remembering that there was something dangerous here. And it's a, it's a gift that God gave to us. Yeah. 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 That's a really good example. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, next question. So um, this is a, in regards to scrupulosity um, and, and the examine, which what I love about the examine too, is really, it is a, a gratitude exercise. Um, since we've been talking about gratitude, uh, someone says that uh, some priests have suggested that the best confessions are specific with number and kind, but they have a personal battle with scrupulosity. So it's very challenging to do. Um, they've considered keeping track in a daily exam and the sins and imperfections. Uh, is that good practice or is it too much checking the boxes? Is, do you think that's helpful or not helpful? Yeah, I think it depends. That's a really good question. My sense is this person is living the life of grace and has been living it for a while, is familiar with confession. Uh, and in, you know, in, someone, in someone's life, if, they, if scrupulosity is, is present in someone's life uh, and they're living the life of grace, that, that's just a heavy cross. Let's uh, just acknowledge it. Scrupulosity is, is an oversensitivity to, um, to the possible sinfulness of certain things. Uh, it sounds like it's odd, you know, how could you be oversensitive to sin? But, um, you know, so a scrupulous person will often see sin where there is no sin. Uh, and that, just imagine, you know, how hard that can be, what a heavy cross that can be. Uh, so I don't know this person's particular case. I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to about the priest who recommends uh, sins in number and kind. The general recommendation is when we go to confession, if we have grave sins, uh, we confess the number and the kind. Um, you know, we don't just say, you know, well, I stole, but we say, you know, I, I defrauded my company three times this past year of $100,000 each, each time. You know, so the number and kind of the sin when it's a grave sin. Um, and then for venial sins and for imperfections, I mean, you know, venial sin is where, 
well, you, you probably know those distinctions, but for those, the recommendation of the way to bring them to confession is going to depend on the person's own, the person's personality, their temperament, and the season of their spiritual life. Uh, because it's it can be for a scrupulous person, they can get very, very disturbed, experience a lot of interior turbulence, trying to identify every single imperfection and every single uh, venial sin, uh, when that really isn't necessary. What What's most important uh, for frequent confession as we go is to, again, to be understand, to be kind of examining, okay, where in my life uh, is God working and how am I responding and and where, can, where did I respond in a less than Christ-like way? That's the most important thing. Now, for some people, it's going to be, if they're maybe pretty lax, then they're going to need help reflecting on that. And they're going to say, well, uh, you know, they might need, they, they might find it very useful to have a, a very specific questionnaire that they use. St. Ignatius of Loyola used to use his own um, particular examine uh, where, you know, there were specific points and he would have his little checkbox and mark an X and and that was helpful for him. Um, for others, for someone who's uh, struggling with scrupulosity, I would say the other, I would go to the other side. I would say, you give yourself, um, you, you determine ahead of time, ideally in conversation with a confessor or a spiritual director with someone you trust, you determine ahead of time the frequency of your confession, and you determine ahead of time how long you're going to take preparing for that confession. Uh, and you know, for example, you could say, okay, you're going to go to confession uh, twice a month, first Friday and third Friday. Um, and if I'm your spiritual director and you're st st suffering from scrupulosity, I could say something like the following. You're going to take, you're going to get to the, the church early for, and you're going to take 10 minutes, no more, no less to prepare your confession. Whatever comes to mind in those 10 minutes, that's what you're going to confess. Um, so that way there's, you're, you're kind of putting really kind of objective guardrails around this tendency to overanalyze um, our fault and our weaknesses. Uh, so I hope that helps a little bit. I don't know, Anne, if you want to follow up on that at all. Yeah, well, actually, I got a message here that came in. It says their parish priest will stand on the side. I don't know what that means. Just ask how long since confession, but we do not actually specify sins. And that is it. Is this valid? Although I do not feel I fulfilled, I feel I fulfilled forgiven only venial sins on my behalf. So maybe um, it's like they're doing a general confession or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's not making a lot of sense to me. Uh, in general, the for a valid confession, we need to confess some sins <laughs> or some imperfections, um, some some areas where you know we recognize that we haven't lived up to to what Christ asks of us. So. Um, I can't imagine a priest saying you don't have to actually confess any of them. Um, but if someone's struggling with scrupulosity, I can, I can imagine a spiritual director saying, giving some specific guidelines, you know, don't go into too much detail. Uh, you know, keep, your, keep, keep it simple, that type of thing. Yeah, he says that their sins are forgiven, but they don't actually say their sins. And, you know, this... Does, I mean, uh, could you talk, maybe mention to what happens at mass? Because our, you know, technically our uh, venial sins are all forgiven at mass every mass. We go oh yeah. To. So the normal, I mean, uh, the normal means for to receive God's forgiveness of our uh, mortal sins is the sacrament of confession. Uh, that's the gift He's given us uh, for that. Um, and uh, frequent confession, and we're only required to go to confession once a year if we have grave sin on our. Uh, on uh, you know on our conscience right that's the that's the church requirement it's it's mm, kind of minimalistic in that sense but frequent confession is recommended uh, because part of the grace of confession isn't just the forgiveness of sins but strength to continue growing in Christ-like virtue so when we bring our areas of weakness and struggle uh, even if the the sins are 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 venial, or even if they're imperfections, or not even willed, I'm not even choosing, I'm just noticing my weakness, we can still receive the grace of confession. Um, in those cases, when you're really not, when you're confessing mostly imperfections, it's useful as well to say, I mean, this is kind of a, you know, um, traditional advice in the spiritual life, to say, and all the sins of my past life. So you bring where you're feeling your weakness, 
uh, most in this, the recent period, and then you finish in all the sins of my past life. So you bring your sins and your weakness, you receive both the forgiveness and the strengthening. But uh, that's not the only means the church gives us to receive objectively forgiveness for our venial sins and our imperfections. Um, the act of, uh, you know, at the beginning of Mass, when we, when we for I confess to Almighty God and we receive absolution from the priest, that actually is real. It's not just symbolic. <laughs> We're supposed to mean, actually, the, the, the rubrics say the priest is supposed to pause when he invites us to call to mind our sins so we can celebrate the mysteries worthily. Pause so that we can actually call to mind you know, our sins, our weaknesses, our sense of need for God, where we need his grace. And then we pronounce the confitior or whichever of the options are, are given, and then we receive absolution. So that is a real uh, forgiveness. It's another gift that God gives us to experience objectively forgiveness for our sins. But I also advise, you know, anytime I, I find that I've, I've fallen into a sin um, or I'm feeling my weakness, you don't have to wait for confession or for mass to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy on me. There I go again. And he hears that prayer too. Uh, that's more subjective, right? That's a subjective encounter with God's mercy. But God also gives us these objective ones, the sacrament of confession and then the holy sacrifice of the mass, uh, especially that part of it. Great. Um, and this is a, a little off topic, but a question that came in was, is it a sin to give a wedding present to, uh, to two uh, males? Mm. Yeah, it's a tough one, All right? These types of situations are, are, are becoming so much more uh, present. Um, we could probably have a debate about this. Uh, so let's see, what would I say? Um, and, and I'll say this too, the, the, the woman that wrote the question and it did not send a gift, but is feeling a little guilty. Yeah. Uh, well, the reason you'd want to send a gift is because you care about the people or at least one of the people. And you still care about them, even though you might you wouldn't agree with the choice they've made. Um, and so you don't want to condone the choice, but you want to make sure you want to still express that you care about the person. Uh, and that's uh, how do we do that? That's a great place where you need the virtue of prudence. What's the best way to do that? Um, and I find, I mean, the the very best thing to do is to have and and try to explain like sincerely. Hey, you know, I. Um, you know that I don't, depending on the relationship, right? You know, I don't approve of the choice, but, but I still, I still love you. I still care about you. Uh, and, and I, and I want what's truly good for you. Um, and so let me, let, me turn to, let me rephrase the question. So would it be a sin to give a wedding present to two Hindus who were being married with the Hindu, Hindu marriage, right? You know, because the Hindu religion is, you know, not the true religion, right? It's not, it's not in harmony with the truth. So would it be a sin to, it's not the perfect example, but I think the point is similar. You know, we want to be able to find ways that express our love and our uh, esteem for people and our, our, our sincere care for them without necessarily condoning um, what, we, what we see is, is not true, right? It's not true. Um, so uh, that's a tough one. I think it would depend a lot on the relationship, on the gift, and there's other ways to express the love uh, but you want to make sure that you do your part to express that. I think that's probably at the core of that question. I think we got the perfect answer here. You get the masses said, like 30 days of masses for both of them. There <laughs> greatest, you go. I like that. Yeah. gift you could give anyone, the that's sacrifice it. of the mass, right? Yeah, so that's a good one. Go. I like that. There's that's your fun. gift. You care and you're praying for their conversion. So um, another question, uh, kind of in the same realm, if an adult child chooses to marry outside of the church, what does a parent do? Go, not go? How do you, how do you handle it with charity and, and not sin? Yeah, I think that the, the really important thing is, is that last part, right? And it depends on the relationship, it depends a lot on the relationship, and it depends on the conversation. Um, you know, they need to understand what, what you're thinking what you believe, uh, and what you're feeling. And you need to make sure they understand it. So if you just boycott the wedding with no conversation, no explanation, you could end up driving them further from the church, you know, further from God, right? Um, and if you just go to the wedding without saying anything, uh, you know, some, a Catholic who's getting married outside of the church, 
And then, then you could also be encouraging them to, to not take seriously what God has revealed to us through the doctrine of the church. So the key is the conversation. And, um, you know, and I think that the actual action will flow from that. Uh, you know, you got to have that conversation. You have to show the balance. I don't want to give a, a specific, like a, a one, one size fits all rule for these very difficult situations, because it really depends on, on a lot of factors. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it depends on a lot of factors and these can be, you can have gray areas here. Uh, I think so. That would be my, yeah, answer even depending why, why is the, um, why are they outside of the church? Did they grow up outside? Great point. You know, like did they grow up without the church and the parent has had a conversion later on, or, you know, Great have point. they did they have a trauma in the church? Did they just leave? Do they know? Do they, you know, really know? So yeah, it's definitely um hard. So um kind of I don't know if these are the same questions one that just came in and I know we're nearing time um but there was one over uh, uh, that someone had sent in prior uh to the webinar I wanted to get to but the question is basically what stops us from completely giving ourselves over to God and they have a firm resolve to do daily rosy daily mass weekly confession um they have the freedom to do these things but they can't seem to do them. It kind of reminds me of, you know, St. Paul and the scriptures. Um, they, they want to break the chain that holds them back. What would you, what would you recommend? And then uh, f- for someone doing that, and is that, is that connected to becoming a missionary disciple? And and when you're done with that, maybe would you just talk about that book and, and, you know, I don't know if these two are related, but. Could you read the first sentence of the question again? What stops us from completely giving ourselves over to God? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, it's actually, it's a question. It's a very deep question. If you think about it, um, really we give, we give ourselves over to God completely afresh every day. And we give ourselves completely and the completion, the completely is relative to our own level of spiritual maturity. A five-year-old child um, who meets Christ, a six-year-old child who meets Christ, uh, who loves Christ with a six-year-old mind and a six-year-old heart, can give themselves to Christ completely at first communion. Complete gift of self with their six-year-old mind and six-year-old heart. Uh, And then a 17-year-old who feels the call to consecrate their life completely to God in religious life gives themselves completely on the day of their profession, 17, 18-year-old, completely. Like they're holding nothing back. But the completion is the 17-year-old level of self-knowledge, the 17-year-old level of self-possession. And then when they're 37... After 20 more years of life, spiritual life, emotional life, relational life, apostolic life, they have discovered more about themselves. They've grown. And so they renew that total gift of self um, uh, when they renew their profession 20 years later. And it's still a complete gift of self, but it's in accordance with my 37-year-old possession and knowledge of myself. So this question coming into the person, it's not a question of certain practices that I do are, 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 you know, those are, those are the, the way um, that I, that I express my gift of self, but I can offer my heart. You can offer your heart completely yourself, completely to God. Right now we finish this webinar, you kneel down in front of your crucifix and you say, Lord, all that I know of myself, all that I possess of myself, I give it to you. And I want to follow you completely. And then that gift continues to, you continue to, you renew it the next day and you continue to live it out. And here's the thing. Here's where I think there is a connection with the concept of being a missionary disciple. Disciple is a follower. And as long as we're still in this pilgrimage through our our lives on earth, we're following Christ. We're journeying. We're not in the, we're not at the father's home. You know, that comes on the other side. And so the gift is constantly renewed. We're never done giving it. 
Uh, I was just reading an article where they quoted, um, uh, I was a Jesuit priest from the last century, talked about the only thing we really have to look forward to is death. Because that's when, that's the only time we can complete in the existential sense, the gift of ourselves to God, when our life is complete. So the, the complete gift is renewed each day. Now, I hope that if you reflect on that, that will help take the pressure off. Because I'm hearing in that question, some pressure, as if I've got to finish it now. I've got to, no, it's a journey. It's, it's a daily journey together with the Lord and a joyful journey. So if you're feeling a pressure and an anxiety, um, as if you have to be perfect in the gift already, um, I would say there's something there. Hey, relax, give yourself completely, and then be a missionary disciple today, which means um, a missionary disciple. Disciple is a follower. I obey God. I give what he asks. I receive what he gives. And part of that is always being a messenger of Christ to others. And that can take so many different forms. That's the missionary part. I'm like a missile sent out by God. And I, I encounter people and I encounter groups of people and I, I explode with the grace of God and, and I become a messenger, uh, a missionary. So those are two uh, integral dimensions of what it means to be a Christian, a Christian. We continue to follow Christ, obey him, imitate his virtues, get to know him, grow in our intimacy with him. And part of that obedience is we also share with others the discovery of Christ so that they too can become all that God created them to be. Uh, and this book, 60 Days to Becoming a Missionary Disciple, is just 60 short chapters, which kind of break down the two great commandments, how to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and how to love your neighbor as yourself, as those two dimensions, disciple and missionary. So I have short chapters that can help uh, kind of educate and stimulate reflection, so you can kind of discover where God is inviting you to go deeper in both those dimensions of your identity as a Christian. Yeah, what I love about all of that, too, is like the completely giving yourself over to God every day is it's almost the same. It's the same thing we do with mental prayer every morning. It's not about it's it's just about showing up every single day. And if we fail that day, you just try it again the next day. But if there is a, a uh, you know, we have to grow in that self-knowledge because in between giving ourselves over if we don't understand the gift that we are and don't allow ourselves to receive God's love, that like you said, all those things are expressions of the way that we're showing love to God. Well, we might not believe that we're worthy of his love deep down. So it might be hard to, you know, do, th we might have this pressure that you're saying to do all these things for him. Cause we want to express our love. We want so badly to be loved by him, but at the same time, we're, Maybe there's that fear there yeah. um, that's not letting him in because that's, that's, it might be, um, it just might be really scary for us to understand that we're just loved without yeah. having to do or having to, you know, take care of things or be hyper responsible for others or, you yeah. know, uh, be perfect. These constructs, like we said in the very beginning of the things we've built in our in our minds, the way that we're supposed to be. So, um, yeah, I just, I love that. And I, I even think, you know, we should all just wake up every morning in our beds. Like I give myself completely to you, God. I, I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that because that, that does tie in another theme that came up the trust. So going back to the very first line of this question, what is it that holds us back from giving ourselves completely? Right? You could rephrase the question. What is keeping me from living a deeper communion with God right now? And it always ends up going back to, to, to area where I can trust more. And that trust depends on my experience of being loved by him, of receiving the gift of myself from him over and over again, more and more deeply, more and more completely. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And then it even ties back to the very first thing about being quiet in prayer, because mm. God loves me. And we got this great relationship and all of a sudden he's not there. And it's like, am I still loved? Like, where are you? Right, right. You know? It's just, yeah, it's great. Um, one other last question, if you have just a moment, uh, I, I think I know the answer, but is there a problem with the mass if the priest host is not touched during the consecration? It was just laid on the paten and the paten was elevated. The host was never taken into his hands during the consecration. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, uh, it's hard. It's hard for me to answer that. Uh, I'd want to see the uh, instant replay, you know, see if what he actually did. <laughs> Um, I think in general, however, 
Um, if you go to mass and there's nothing that's clearly and obviously an abuse of the right of the church, um, then, then you can trust that God is going to act uh, through the mass and your attendance at the mass in the way that he intends through the mass. Even if the priest might do, you know, a couple of things that you don't like, or you don't understand, but you know, if he's using the right matter, he's not using Coke and pizza, you know, and he's basically following the prayers and the rubrics, you can be assured that God's going to honor that. Um, the rubric in that particular case does instruct the priest to uh, hold the host, uh, the non-consecrated host over the altar, which means you pick it up from the paten. Um, now, I, I, I want, as I said, I'd want to see the instant replay, and I'd want to hear what the priest said, uh, why he didn't do that, you know, especially if he doesn't do it on a regular basis. There might be a reason you might have a dispensation. The rubric says that. If you, um, if you don't remember the rubric, or if you've become a little sloppy on the rubric, it wouldn't make the, I don't think it would make the mass invalid. I don't think so. I think it'd still be a valid mass, but maybe not, maybe not illicit consecration, but a valid one. That's a, but I, again, I'd want to see the replay. <laughs> Thanks, Father. Slow motion, you know, the slow motion replay and see what was going on there. Great. Well, Miss Stephanie, just uh, Stephanie Burke just wrote, great webinar, great to see you. God's wisdom through you, Father. Um, praying you can find time to rest at the retreat center with us soon. So, oh, yes. I haven't been to the retreat center. I keep putting it on my calendar, but it keeps getting pushed out. So, well, and you just said are, you're in Georgia. So I'm in Georgia. I know. The, I have no excuse. Drive. Right. <laughs> I'm going to get out there. I'm going to get out there. Awesome. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. If you, um, you know, want to say bye in the chat box, here, we'll wrap it up. Father, would you give us a blessing as we depart here? Sure. Heavenly Father, I invoke your blessing upon all of the participants in this webinar and their families. You know their needs and their hopes and the desires of their heart. I ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon them the special outpouring of the gift of wisdom so that they can know your goodness in a fresh way every, every day. And Holy Mary, I invoke your intercession on these beloved children of yours and your brothers and sisters. Intercede for them and may the rays of grace that have been entrusted to you not be wasted, but penetrate their hearts and their minds and their bodies for the glory of God and the advance of Christ's kingdom. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. This was a blessing for us. Thank you.